Y'all good? Good morning, and welcome to Hicks United Methodist Church. 
My name is Jim Lewis, and we are so glad to have you joining us today, whether that be in person or online. We have just a few announcements to share with you so that you can connect more fully with our mission and ministry here at Hicks. Good morning, and welcome to Hickson United Methodist Church. My name is Jim Lewis, and we are so glad to have you joining us today, whether that be in person or online. We have just a few announcements to share with you so that you can connect more fully with our mission and ministry here at Hickson UMC. First, we are excited to announce our next church-wide series called Rooted and Growing. With recent challenges in the United Methodist Church, the reality is, that many faithful members of our congregation hold different perspectives on important topics of faith. This raises an important question. How do we, as a vibrant and thriving United Methodist congregation, discern and hold close the things that are most important in our mission and ministry together? During the season of Lent, we are going to explore this question through the lens of our Methodist heritage. Our series will include weekly readings from the book Recapturing the Wesley's Vision, sermons from our pastors, discussion through Sunday school classes, and a dedicated midweek dinner and small group series. It all kicks off on Sunday, February 11th with a church-wide luncheon and series introduction from 12 to 3 p.m. We're providing the food and simply ask you to RSVP. We also want to strongly encourage everyone to go ahead and order the book for our weekly readings. You can RSVP and order the book through our website or by calling the church office. Our Wesleyan heritage provides us with tools to maintain connection in the face of polarization. Through this study, our goal is to be rooted in the core tenets of our Christian faith as we anticipate growing together in what it means to follow the way of Jesus. So mark your calendars for Sunday, February 11th. Yes, that's Super Bowl Sunday, but you will be home in plenty of time to watch the game. Next, as we celebrate the joy of new beginnings, don't miss New Saint Sunday on January 28th. We want to honor all the babies born in our church in the last year in each of our services. To make sure your little one is included, please submit all the required information by January 17th. You can conveniently do this by using the link on our website. We can't wait to celebrate these precious additions to our church family. Step into a day of community and compassion and construction right here in Chattanooga on Saturday, February 3rd. Our Habitat for Humanity Service Day is an opportunity for church members to roll up their sleeves, grab a hammer, make a lasting difference in the lives of local families in need. Participants must be at least 16 years of age. For more details and to sign up, visit our website. Finally, we have scheduled our next Retired Lunch Fellowship for Tuesday, February 6th. Join other Hickson UMC retirees and staff for a time of fellowship and great food prepared by Chef Julie Smith. The menu is meatloaf, mashed potatoes, peas, biscuits, and dessert with a cost of $12. RSVP online or by calling the church office. And as always, thank you for being a vital part of our mission vision, and goals here at Hickson UMC. Have a blessed week. I thought my brain hit rewind there for a second at the start of that, but uh, anyway. Good morning. Welcome to the river service here at Hickson United Methodist Church. I'm Steve Bowman. I'm one of the lay leaders here. I uh, would like to welcome everyone this morning, especially visitors that are here with us this morning. Thank you for spending your worship time with us today. If you are a visitor, before you leave today, back there in the back, there's a little connect card. It looks just like this. There's some sitting back there. If you would, if you wouldn't mind, just fill this out. There's just a little bit of information about you, and we can get in touch with you and let you know a little bit more about what's going on here at the, in the life of Hickson United Methodist Church. So, uh, once again, thank you for attending today. All right, I know everybody's on pins and needles about the S word that could happen this week. 
And Todd's got this. Yeah, all our teachers are going, yeah. Uh, funny how that works. But uh, anyway, you know, we could have an inch. We could have two feet. Uh, we could have nothing. This is Chattanooga, so you might as well expect the unexpected. But I will say this much for sure. It's definitely going to be cold. And uh, I was thinking about that this morning, coming up on an anniversary of, I know we're getting ready to go, our youth are getting ready to go to resurrection here next week. Uh, and it's going to be cold all this week. And I will say this, for our young people that have been tempted to stick their tongue to a flagpole or a fence, don't do it. Because what you saw in a Christmas story actually happens. And Todd, you can attest to this, uh, Lisa Maddox on Resurrection probably 10, 15 years ago did this as we were standing outside getting ready to go to the convention center. She stuck her tongue on the top rail of the chain link fence. And I really don't remember how we got it off, but it wasn't, it, yeah, she pulled it off, yeah, which is, which is not the thing to do. So uh, everybody be safe this week. Keep, keep your ear on the radio and watch, especially I know if it affects anything we do here, which it very well could. Uh, keep, keep an eye out on uh, your email and everything like that. But everybody be safe this week. It's going to be. And, and, and I, hope, I hope for some of you folks we get some snow. And it'll be gone quick, I hope. So anyway, uh, if you would today just lift everyone up in prayer this week to be safe. And um, you notice our prayer station over here, uh, before the service, as always, you can come and light a candle for, uh, if you have a prayer request or praise for that matter, spend a moment in meditation for that. You can do that, like I said, before the service starts or in the next little bit while the band plays here. That's all I've got. We'll turn it over to Matt. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me, I forgot something very important. <clears throat> How many of you enjoy our hospitality table out there? Raise your hand. Okay. So if you do, you have an opportunity to sign up and help with the hospitality table. Uh, you know, a Sunday school class can do it. You can do it with other individuals. We've got several openings coming up. Uh, this starts, do, 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 do. well, we still got some openings recent in, in the upcoming, but I'm gonna pass this around and hopefully by the time it gets from here to back there, We'll have all those openings signed, uh, filled out. There's information on the back about how this works. It's not really hard to do, folks. Don't get intimidated by it. It's not that big a deal. You can provide just a little bit of uh, the stuff that goes out there, and uh, especially if you work with some of your friends or your classmates. So I'm going to pass that around. Now I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Good morning, friends. As we join together in worship this morning, let us prepare for the presence of the Lord to come into this place as we pray together. Almighty God, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world. Grant that your people, illumined by your word and your sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth now and forever. Amen. Let us all stand, join our hearts and our voices together as we worship with each other.
Grandeur. 
mountain shall be moved and the power of the gospel shall prevail for we know To our weekly prayer verse, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. I ask you to join with me in reading that scripture. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Let us pray. Gracious Father, our lives are ordered according to your will and by your hand. You are at work in our world, in our lives, and in our churches to point us back to you. When we find ourselves confused and lost and disoriented, raise signposts to direct our attention to your Son and our Savior, the fullness of your revelation of your grace, love, and purpose for all of creation. May your grace follow after us drawing us back into your arms and sending us out with renewed purpose into the world as your witnesses. Christ, our Lord, you have revealed yourself to us. When we could not turn towards you, you turned towards us. When we could not come to you, you came to us. Thank you for your revelation. Thank you for the crisis of decision that you evoke in each of our lives. Thank you for your calling, which enables us to respond in faith. May each of us eagerly look and listen for your calling in our lives and in our world and embrace the grace you offer us to say yes to you, the one who long before said yes to us. Holy Spirit, draw us into the life, love, and celebration of the triune God in a world of darkness and despair, in a world of fear and anxiety. Remind us of your constant presence and your faithful work, finding in every heartbreak a promise and in every cry a prayer. May your power enable us to be your witnesses, inviting all the world and all we encounter to come and see the new thing that you are doing, even here and even now. And Lord, we join our voices now in praying in the manner our Lord taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
At this time, those who wish to be dismissed to growing in faith worship, you are free to do so. Meet back by the sound booth. Uh, As I prepared to, uh, as we move into a time of, of our offering moment, our ministry celebration this week being uh, the Bethlehem Center, the, the ministry that we partner with, that we support, uh, that we want to lift up uh, to your attention this week, the Bethlehem Center here in Chattanooga, I, I struggled a little bit this morning figuring out just what to say, because um, I do a lot, uh, and I had a limited time to say that. And then... You know, perhaps revelation from God, I don't know, a moment struck me, uh, the thought struck me that someone at the Bethlehem Center at some time has labored hard over the language of what they do. So rather than try to reinvent the wheel, I decided I would just share with you their language, their words of what they do and why they do it. So from their website, I want to offer you a bit of good news of the good things that God is doing at and through the Bethlehem Center in Chattanooga. So from their history page, the story of the Bethlehem Center traces back to 1920 when a group of Methodist women came together with a shared mission of making a lasting impact on the lives of those in need. Inspired by a deep sense of faith, social responsibility, and guided by a commitment to spiritual growth, education, and leadership development, they laid the foundation of what would become a transformative force in the community. So they worked for over a hundred years here in Chattanooga under the mission statement, their mission goal, inspired by the gospel, we build lasting relationships with Chattanooga's youth and families by encouraging spiritual growth, education, and leadership development. So the mission of the Bethlehem Center, who we support and who we uh, share uh, in ministry with here in our local area, uh, offers to people, youth and families, uh, a space and a, and a way to, to grow, to become the people God has called them to be. And, and that's done in community. It is so important to grow together, to become leaders together, to be educated together, because God calls us all together to this place to become the people God is calling us to be by the power of the Spirit. So the Bethlehem Center enables these vital aspects of Christian ministry. Um, and Christian Mission right here in Chattanooga, uh, and it is something well worth your attention and your support, and we celebrate the good work being done uh, there and through their faithfulness, and, which is uh, resultant of your faithfulness and giving and your support. So as we move into our time of offering, I do invite you to give by any of the three usual means in service. Uh, you'll find tithing envelopes and boxes at the back by the exits. Uh, feel free to drop your offering in there uh, on your way out, or you can give online on the website hicksonumc.org slash give, or by text at the number listed on the screen. Just know that however you feel led and are comfortable giving, and however much you feel comfortable and are led to give, that God will use that abundantly for the sake of the gospel and the spread of his lordship and his reign in all of creation. So now let us join together in a prayer of thanksgiving for all the wonderful work that God is doing in and through the Bethlehem Center and numerous other mission partners. Let us pray. <clears throat> All things come from you, O God, and with gratitude we return to you what is yours. You created all that is, and with love formed us in your image. When our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. All that we are and all that we have is a trust from you. And so in gratitude for all your gifts... We offer you ourselves and all that we have 
in union with Christ's offering for us. By your Holy Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, through Christ our Savior. Amen. Good morning. Would you please stand for the reading of the scripture? I will be reading today from John chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is God's word for all people. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. You may be seated and let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we are so thankful for your presence in this place today. Prepare in us a space and a willingness to receive you, light of the world, the one upon whom we will see angels ascending and descending in greater things than this. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we do pray and give thanks. Amen. Come and see. Come and see. With these words, Philip answers Nathaniel's doubts. With these words, Philip invites the naysayer with prejudice against Nazareth to experience for himself the new thing that God is doing in and through Jesus Christ. Perhaps, I can't help but wonder, perhaps that's all Christian witness has to be. Perhaps we've made things too difficult, turning evangelism and witness into a cottage industry of sorts where there are professional evangelists proclaiming the word at, at grand crusades only to roll out of town and harangue yet another crowd in yet another city the next day, detached from any real spiritual or community formation. Perhaps, perhaps we've sought to play such an elevated role in the drama of God's salvation that we've missed entirely the heart of what it means to be Christ's witnesses in the world. Perhaps, just perhaps, we've crafted such logically airtight and sound apologetics and defended them until our voices give out only for the conceptual box that we've sought to wrap around God to be shockingly empty. Perhaps in our making evangelism a business, just like everything else, this is America after all, we have lost the purpose and goal of evangelism. Some things, as you know, as you've experienced, just cannot be taught or understood outside of a direct encounter. Try all you want to learn some hands-on skill. Try to read schematics and diagrams and blueprints all you want, but for most of us, without hands-on practice, we wouldn't be able to do much at all. YouTube is famous for its tutorials for a reason, whether they are how to play a guitar or how to change a fuel pump. But each of us has some skill or ability that we now possess because someone at one point showed us how to do it. I vividly, for one, remember the day that I expressed cursory interest in playing basketball to my grandfather. 
Now, I had never been all too interested in team sports, but my grandfather prided himself on his athletic ability and prowess, playing basketball with 20-year-olds well into his 40s, and he wouldn't let you forget holding his own. I played a bit in PE at school and had done moderately well enough to pique my interest. And that was all that he needed to hear that day. From that moment, it was on. He took me across the street from their house to the high school gym, to which he at some point had somehow finagled a key out of the school principal and put me through a rigorous private training camp. Quickly, it was discovered I was just absolutely horrible with my offhand. Left-handed layups and dribbling and going left were just not an option available for me. And even though I would not ever play competitively in any real sense, this was unacceptable to my grandfather. No grandson of his would lack such a skill if he had any say at all in the matter. And so, in a, a grand light bulb moment, maybe an epiphany for him, he rendered my right hand useless. He, he went back home, he, he got an old t-shirt, and he, he tied my, my right wrist to my right thigh and made me practice basketball for that long, long, long time. It could have been an hour, I don't know, it felt longer, with just my left hand. It was tough to learn. It was embarrassing. Thank God no one else was there. But there for a while, I got pretty decent with my offhand. Now, before you ask, my grandfather passed away back in 2019, and I haven't played basketball in any real sense in quite some time, so don't ask me to demonstrate this former skill to you. But I only ever learned a new skill because someone lovingly told me, and at times coerced me, to come and see. The Lordship of Jesus, the, the common, ordinary human from Nazareth, seems to be, according to Scripture, one of those things that we cannot grasp or understand apart from a direct encounter. No one beats, batters, or berates Nathaniel into accepting Jesus. He is simply invited to come and see for himself. Jesus is a walking crisis of judgment. He is the confrontation of God's revelation. When he is encountered, when we encounter Christ, a decision must be made, either for or against. His calling to follow enables the one he calls, his hearer, enables the hearer to respond appropriately. His ministry at this point in John's gospel has not even properly begun. He's performed no miracles. He's offered no teaching. He, he doesn't even so much as offer the, those first disciples a persuasive PowerPoint presentation for why certain folks like Andrew, Peter, and Philip ought to follow him. He, instead, he just shows up one day and says, hey, you, follow me. And what else can they do? Sure. When they encounter Jesus, they are confronted and called in the depth of their being. When they hear this call, a new life entirely is opened up to them. This is what Nathaniel is invited to come and see. This is what John's gospel invites you and I to come and see. Philip serves as witness to Christ just as Scripture serves us as witness to Christ. Neither Philip nor Scripture can give us the person of Christ, but they can sure point us to him. Now, pointing, you may be thinking, especially if you're a parent or you've recently spent time with a parent, pointing is rather rude. You remember being taught not to point at people, particularly in public. Don't point. Or the famous don't turn around, don't look behind you, but that person over there is wearing a crazy outfit, and everybody always goes, where? You know, don't make it obvious. Don't point. You'll make people self-conscious. Don't point at people. And yet, we must necessarily be people who point, who do just that, who, who point beyond ourselves to Jesus. 
This is the entirety of Christian ministry and witness. This is the content. To discern Christ's presence, even in the most unlikely of spaces, and to point Him out for others to encounter. The invitation of come and see the new thing that God is doing. This is, is the entirety, this is the fullness, the content of preaching, of, of Christian proclamation, a, a task which all of us have been called to via our baptism. And, and when we talk about pointing to Jesus, of, of the necessity and the character of Christian witness, perhaps you, like me, think of John the Baptist. Now, John's entire vocation as forerunner of the Messiah is to be a witness, a living signpost directing people to the radically new thing God is doing in Christ. He stands throughout time, pointing away from himself and to Jesus, saying he must de- increase, but I must decrease, as he will later say in the fourth gospel. And in my opinion, for my money's worth, there is no better depiction of John faithfully fulfilling his vocation than the one given us by German Renaissance artist Matthias Grunewald. Grunewald's Eisenheim altarpiece, before you now, on the screen, painted from 1516 to 1520 for the monastery of St. Anthony in Eisenheim, which specialized in hospital work, caring particularly for plague victims and those with infectious skin disorders. Appropriately, Grunewald depicts the crucified Jesus just off-center. Things just aren't neat and harmonious in the real world. And the crucified Jesus depicted off-center is is covered in in sores and in lesions that the plague sufferers, those with infectious skin diseases, knew well. Grunewald depicts Jesus as not only knowing but understanding and also bearing the affliction of the plague victims. To our right, as we look upon the altarpiece to Jesus' left, Well, there stands John the Baptist, anachronistically present, given that he was executed years before Jesus' crucifixion. But there John stands, out of his time, out of all time, and for all time, pointing us towards the crucified Christ. His outstretched finger, his twisted arm and outstretched finger, as he points to the Messiah, attracted the attention of Karl Barth and subsequently every preacher and theologian who's ever valued Karl Barth. You can pretty much pick them out. They'll have a picture of the Eisenheim altarpiece in their office somewhere. But John's finger attracted the attention of Barth, who kept a print of Grunewald's painting above his desk where he wrote and frequently commented upon his desire for his life and his theological work to be that finger to be that finger pointing to Christ. The greatness of a witness, the faithfulness of a witness tasked with pointing to Christ is in pointing away from ourself, refusing the limelight, stepping off stage when one's task is completed. Nathaniel's derision, his prejudice against Nazareth, leads to a doubt regarding the goodness of anyone from such a place. Can, can anything good come out of a place like that? Now, Scripture is unclear as to why Nathaniel holds such a grudge. There's posited claims about why this is, but Scripture never tells us. But his grudge almost causes him to miss it, almost causes him to miss an encounter that will change his life. He almost sees Philip's witness and hears Philip's call to come and see and could very easily have rejected it. And yet, according to Scripture, he goes along. And 
maybe mumbling under his breath the whole way, but when he encounters Jesus, Jesus shares that before Nathaniel ever knew anything about Jesus, Jesus knew Nathaniel. Jesus has seen him. He knows him. He knows who Nathaniel is and, and where he was before Philip approached. Now this, this odd episode of John 1 is it's almost comical. It, it almost just doesn't make any sense at all. Such a statement of, oh, I, I know who you are. You, you were under that fig tree before Philip called you. It elicits a seemingly disproportionate response. Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And yet, foolish as it may seem, Nathaniel responds. It seems in John's gospel, as you read through it, that those who doubt are gifted abundant grace. Nathaniel bears with him his grudge as he approaches Jesus, and yet he is called an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Thomas will later become famous for a, a moment of doubt, all the while being the first person to refer to the resurrected Jesus as my Lord and my God. Nicodemus will come to Jesus by night, seriously doubting the ability of anyone to be born a second time, and he will end up caring for Jesus' body, literally burying Jesus after Christ has been crucified. Those who doubt, those who can't put it all together logically, those who almost miss it, those who face the confrontation of Revelation and and almost have to turn away, are precious in the sight of Christ. Grace enables even the skeptical and the disenchanted to respond and to find in Jesus their own calling and their own vocation. Jesus' call to follow enables the necessary response, particularly and especially in the surprising and shocking places and surprising and shocking places people. Going back for a moment to the Eisenheim altarpiece and John the Baptist and the unlikeliness of Christian witness, Karl Barth comments, John the Baptist and Grunewald's crucifixion can only point, and here everything is bolder and more abrupt because here all indication of the revelation of the Godhead is lacking. Point to a wretched, crucified, dead man. In our witness, whatever we must say about God in Christ, we must say that Jesus of Nazareth is the full image and character of the triune God. Jesus Christ is the self-disclosure of God, fully and finally. In the Eisenheim altarpiece, plague victims the rejected and cast out plague victims find a Christ who looks remarkably, scandalously like them. Jesus Christ, the plague sufferer. In the Eisenheim altarpiece, those who would demean and dehumanize those who suffer find a Christ who looks remarkably, scandalously like the spurned victims. Nathaniel finds a Nazarene Jesus of all folks. He is confronted by God in flesh, standing before him in a scandalous way. Because God's revelation to us confronts us, oftentimes attacking our, our most deeply held notions and ideas of what is proper for God. Because even religion can be a hindrance of encountering and being changed by the fullness of God's revelation to us in Jesus Christ. We can be too scandalized. We can prefer the temple over and against the one to whom the temple points. What kind of God takes upon himself our failures and, and our rebellion and, and dies under its weight? What, what kind of God embraces our enemies and calls us to join him there? Jesus answers this question at the end of our reading for today when, when he responds to Nathanael. Do, do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? 
you will see greater things than this. Truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. You will see greater things than this. Granted, we, we may not think that that is too difficult of a promise given the almost comic nature of their meeting, but what we can easily miss as we read this text in our English translations is the broadening of the scope of this particular text at this particular point. The, the second person singular, you, becomes second person plural in the last verse. For lack of a better word, y'all. Jesus' you turns into a y'all, and the English teachers shudder alongside Nathaniel. But, but John expands the meaning of the text here. The, the reader, as well as Nathaniel, and the rest of the disciples, given the eyes necessary to make a faith commitment, will see greater things than this. The, the reader, too, will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus himself in his body becomes a completion, a fulfillment, the fullness of Jacob's ladder. God's identity as a God involved with creation, a God of mission, will be disclosed by the Son of Man. Jesus himself will be God's great radical new thing. Religion, you see, doesn't evolve into proper relationship with God. Human progress does not bring us naturally to the Lord. We must encounter his interruption, his confrontation for ourselves. Oftentimes we encounter him through the witness of others, much like actual skills Many, if not most, of you are here now because someone loved you enough to drag you along at some point. Each of us needs that fellow witness who invites us, like Philip, come and see. And each of us have a responsibility to be a witness, like, like Philip, like, like Grunewald John the Baptist, pointing away from ourselves and to someone greater especially in the darkness and brokenness of the world. In truth, we are all confronted by God's self-disclosure in Jesus Christ. When Jesus offers himself up for us, each of us are faced with a crisis or a point of decision. We're given plenty of opportunities to, to turn back, to, to become scandalized and make of Christ a more appropriate and acceptable Messiah according to our predispositions and inclinations. But should we have the courage to accept the faith that Christ offers and grants us this day and each day, we'll be able to see Christ in the people and places not only that we love and we eagerly anticipate Him, but we'll be able to see Christ in the people and places we despise. We will be enabled with the eyes of faith to notice Christ active in the world. We will, on the other side of, of the confrontation of God's revelation and by the transformation of the Spirit, we'll encounter each other not as enemies to be assaulted or converted to our way of thinking, but as family to be loved. We will, in short, by God's grace, meet Christ in our loving embrace of one another. And if that sounds a little bit optimistic for you, and if you're still not sold, I simply invite you to come and see.
This week, go forth and point, point to Jesus in each encounter, in each place, to each person, and by the grace of God know that Christ is present in our suffering, in our joy. Go forth and point, and may the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the partnership of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Your name is power.